Well, welcome back to Barley and Hops. I'm George. This is the channel that will offer you as much information as we possibly can, but this is not your only source. So, and I'll put some links below for Jesse at Stillet and for Bearded and Bored. Uh, uh, two excellent channels for you to garner some other tips and tricks and processes and procedures uh, to satisfy your brewing or distilling pleasures. Now, today we've got, what, I've, what I have today is, is simply a couple of things that I wanted to show you um, and demonstrate. Uh, and I'm actually going to do a little bit of time-lapse photography for you to show you some things that happen. Uh, we're going to do a real quick cleaning. Don't let this intimidate you. Uh, I'm going to do some, I'm going to mix up a cleaning solution for my copper. Well, I'm going to show you how to do that one more time. Uh, I've got a liter of water, and we're going to do that. Uh, someone noticed uh, in my two rice fermenters back here uh, an adaptation, and we're going to discuss that. And also, uh, all the questions that have arisen from what do I think the alcohol by volume is of my sake? Well, uh, we're going to show you how I actually can determine that using a venometer. And I'll also throw that link in below so you can order one of those if you want to. They're somewhere around 10 bucks, uh, but they're valuable to have. Okay, let's get this thing going. And now here's what I want to show you. This is from my G still. This is uh, one of the, uh, the this, uh, visible glass uh, portion uh, that's full of these, these copper springs. Uh, and now these copper springs, after use, you know, of course, all copper starts to turn tarnished. Um, and that's the activity of it with uh, other chemicals that go through the still and also with some air. Uh, this reaction on the surface of the copper causes it to get dull and dingy looking, so you want to clean that up. Um, and a matter of fact, this video is going to show you why uh, you should clean that up. So, let's get to moving. And this is nothing more than a stand for that so that we can watch it. Um, no, nothing's particular. You don't absolutely have to have one of these. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can use a mason jar to do all this stuff with. Okay, I have. Uh, one liter, that's a little bit more than a quart. I have one liter of um, water, just straight water. I have 100 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide, yes, the 3%. And all I've got to do is add these two together to start with. And the only thing I need now is I need to lower the pH to make this an acidic environment. Uh, which requires, for this size, 40 grams, about an ounce and a half of citric acid. Now, I'll add that in there. All I've got to do now is just give this thing a good shake uh, and get it mixed. Now, we're going to let that set and simmer for just a little bit as I assemble this. Now, um, again, like I said, you don't really need one of these. Uh, I just do it like this because it's so simple. And oh, by the way, this came with a still, so why not use it? Now, uh, once I clamp this on here, all I'm going to do is pour that in and allow that to sit. Uh, what you'll see over a period of time, and this takes, oh, it takes less than 24 hours, but what you'll see over a period of time is you'll see a definite change of color of First of all, the copper itself, and also of the color of the liquid, which will turn a greenish blue. Uh, we'll show you that. Have you ever wondered why, if you're running a copper still, and or you've never cleaned out your packing, why sometimes your distillate comes out and it's blue? This will this will show you why. Uh, now all I got to do is fill this up. There we go. Good. I'll throw the cap on her. And we're going to let this set. And we will come back to show you this in um, oh, oh, a couple hours. And you'll see a distinct difference uh, from where we are now and where we will be then. So let me set that aside. Now, I need to grab one more thing to show you this. 
Okay, I cut off a piece of that copper from my roll of copper mesh. Uh, and this is not extremely dirty, but I can tell that it's, it's dull. Um, what I'm going to do is just roll this up. Uh, and this is, again, just for a demonstration, I'm going to put that in this little pint jar. And since I got a bunch of this left over, I'm only going to fill this halfway. Because what I want to demonstrate to you is when we do this, you'll see how half of this copper will clean and the top half won't. We'll pull that out and look at that. So I'll let that set there. My gosh, we're, we're just about at the point of, uh, yeah, let's describe it. Yeah, I know. have you asked the question? Did you see this on the other video? Um, it was in the, one of the corners of the video, which, oh, by the way, in that corner right there is the uh, subscribe button. Hit subscribe, click the bell, you'll get notifications. That's, uh, that's all I can ask of you. We're nearing 50,000 subscribers. Of course, my goal is a billion, but then, you know, you're not going to get there. But let's do this. Um, here's what I got. I've got, th these, are, these are both rice that have been fermenting for several, several days, uh, over a week now. It's a wonderful process because the rice is converting to fermentable sugars at the same time that the yeast are eating. Okay? Let me grab what I need to show you, and then I'll describe what I've got here. All right, I got it now. I went out and I got one of these. What is that? It's a heat blanket. You know, plain and simple. You know, and a lot of people will advise you not to do what I did, but I find no problem in what I've accomplished with this little device. This thing, I think it cost me like 24 bucks. Well, if you take that blanket out, and what I did was I just chopped off the end of it with a pair of scissors, and it opens up. And with inside here are all these wires. Actually, it's just one long wire. And that wire goes, goes down, up, and down, and up, and down, and up. And the two ends of it come back to the controller. And that's this puppy right here. Uh, now, this has an auto off after 10 hours, and you can set it from 1 to 10, which would be high. And here's the plug-in. So here's the connector right here. And all this is, this is resistance wire. Uh, so it, it, it won't get, it's not like, well, you know, toasters have resistance wire, and they turn red hot. Well, that's because there's a lot of resistance in there. But this is low resistance wire so that it can only get so hot. Uh, it can get warm enough. And if you and what I did is I took, I just put a piece of tape here and I wrapped it around this fermenter. And then we're going to wrap it around this fermenter. And right now I've got it set on seven, about a seven and a half. And I'm trying to maintain, and it's doing very well, maintaining about 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in both of these fermenters so that they will continue to ferment. Because what happens is, is at night, uh, after it, these will start to cool down. And once you know that once you get a mass this much of a volume uh, to a certain temperature, it loses that energy a lot quicker than it retains it. And then once it drops down and the fermentation stops, it takes forever and a day uh, and I keep the shop about 76 degrees, but it keeps, takes forever for it to warm back up. So what do we do is we, we, all, we assist that by just wrapping this wire around here. And I can feel it. It's nice and warm. But what that does is it just keeps the fermenter warm. So that's what I got going on. Now, I, I throw a thermometer in there and test it every once in a while just to make sure it's where I want it to be. And I, and I can adjust my temperature control. Right now, I've got it set just about where... I like it. Uh, I've taken this lid off here uh, for this one because I, I keep opening it up so often. And now that we're at that point, I'll show you again another example of, um, as a matter of fact, look at this. There, you can see all these bubbles appearing and rolling right up the top and right out of our airlock. So you can actually see the fermentation taking place as the CO2 is rising. Now here's what's really interesting. Now look at this close up. Remember I talked about the potential for my uh, rice to be so compact that CO2 gets trapped? 
Look at this. You see these, these bubbles down here? Now these are spaces where I've got CO2 trapped that hasn't released yet. So again, if I insert and stir that, all that CO2 will release and you'll see a whole bunch of, I call it going badass crazy for a few seconds. Uh, and then that'll all fill in solid and then again, as it continues to ferment, these bubbles will start to, or these pockets will start to appear again. That's just because that rice is so compact, it can hold that in there. Now, isn't that amazing? Uh, I, can, I can sit here and watch this happen, uh, and it's almost mesmerizing. So, here, let me show you as an example, and I'll just take this off. It's just a piece of saran wrap with a rubber band around it. And I want, to, want you to watch what happens, and you'll see all these bubbles as I just insert this spoon and I release all those bubbles that are at the bottom. Look at that. See, I'm, released, I'm releasing all of that captured CO2 and it's going nuts. So, that's what we got. So give me an opportunity, I'll put this all back together and we'll come back and talk about that venometer. Alright, if you'll recall when we made that uh, sake um, I, and I explained that, that one of the challenges was that since we weren't able to um, take an initial gravity reading because the conversion and the fermentation were happening at the same time. You see, normally you would convert all to fermentable sugars and measure that and then ferment that, uh, which means that you can determine what your alcohol by volume would be. Well, when it comes to sake, if you're doing it that way, that's the old traditional method, uh, then uh, it's almost impossible. So, but what we have is another device called a venometer, and that's what it looked like. It's just a small tube, and it's marked and graduated on the ends here, and I'm going to do a close-up of this in just a moment. Now, the way this works is I'll use a small pipette, and I'll pull some of this. See, that sake is nice and clear. What, what a, an awesome color that has. Now, um, this sake was actually cold crashed, so if, you, if you're trying to clarify a spirit, you can, do, you can use chemicals, uh, you can allow gravity to work in your favor, uh, and you can also cold crash it, which is just put it in a freezer for a couple of hours and that cold temperature will cause most of everything to fall to the bottom and then uh, you'll have your clear liquid on top. So I did that and I carefully transferred it into another jar. Uh, it really wasn't that cloudy to start with. All right. So what I'll do is you just you, you put you fill this this top reservoir about halfway and you allow six drops to drip out. And what that does is it just makes sure that the entire thing is full of liquid. Now if you've got some solid particulates or you're testing something that's you know that's murky, it, it, you're, you're gonna have a challenge because this has got a very, very small orifice um, that measures the percentage of alcohol as it leaves this cylinder. Uh, but what will happen is you let six drips drip out, and then you dump it, turn it over, and then you can watch it from the top as it starts to work its way back down. Now that, now that level of liquid will stop at the percentage of alcohol that it is measuring, uh, whether that be 1%, 2%, uh, all the way up to 25%. Now, um, I, I have a rough guess. I'm, I was thinking probably 18 or so, but I was absolutely pleasantly surprised when uh, when I tested this. Now, the, its accuracy uh, is, there can be some question, okay? Look, but you're measuring the viscosity, which is how we measure uh, gravity in the first place. So you're measuring the viscosity of this fluid as it's leaving. Um, it's as accurate as you're going to get without any other method. So, is it a really good ballpark figure? You, man, absolutely. You better believe it. Uh, otherwise, you're left to guess. And we know what happens when you guess. You're just out there flapping. You, you really have no good idea. No, you don't have a close idea. Um, let's give that a try. All right. I use a little pipette. And I'll fill this about halfway. Oh, a little bit more than halfway. Sorry about that. There we go, about halfway. And already there's one drop already forming. One, two, three. There we go. Four, 
five, and six. That means that that thing is full. Okay, folks, don't do this at home. I'm, I'm going to do it here because it's my shop. Just dump it. Now, you should be able to watch. As you can see, it starts to, it, it's starting to fall down. And you'll watch that as it makes its way. I'm going to try to watch this at the same time with you. Because it's not that easy to determine. It's real hard to look at. Now, I hope you're able to see what I'm looking at. You can see where the liquid stopped right here, right above that 20 mark. It's about 21%. So, uh, my venometer tells me that this is 21% alcohol by volume, uh, which is pretty darn good for a sake run, and we've done nothing else to it. Uh, again, all I did was cold crash it. Now, here comes the next challenge is, yeah, of course this is reusable, but, but how do you keep it clean? Well, one thing, you need to put water in it, do the same thing, turn it upside down, just let it all run out. But then it tends to get air bubbles and stuff in it. I've got some 91% isopropyl alcohol. Uh, what, you know what's good about isopropyl alcohol? Is that it evaporates really good. So if I take a little bit of that, oh, there we go. And it also does a good job of displacing water because uh, it mixes with it really, really well. And so when this runs out, uh, what it'll do is it's going to clean. It'll sanitize at the same time. Um, there goes one. And I'll let that drip a couple of times, and then I'll dump it out and leave it turned upside down so that everything will run out of it, and that isopropyl alcohol will evaporate, and it takes that water with it. So it'll clean out the inside of this, and it won't leave any air bubbles. Mix it usable over and over and over again. So all you got to do is be cautious with it. There we go. And then find a place to set that where it won't fall over. And allow that to run all the way out. Now, one more thing I want to show you. Now, this has only been about 20, oh, maybe 20 minutes or less. And you can already see, you can already start to see that green hue that's in there. You see that, now that was stain, that's stainless steel, that's just a stainless steel scrub pad that keeps them together. And you can already see that green hue that starts to develop. So, this is a good indicator and in this one, uh, there you go. You see that? Oh, I've got a real lightly tinged green, so or blue. We'll we'll be back, and I'll show you in a few hours. Here we have four hours. Now look at this. If I turn it sideways, you see how clean that is, as opposed to what's at the top. And so far, oh, see that blue there? And they are much cleaner. I'm just going to let this go for another day. That's a wrap for you. So that does it. Now you can see why when you run that copper still with copper scrubbers in it or whatever you do, or your stainless steel, and you're not cleaning that cop, those copper uh, mesh, uh, you can see why sometimes your distillate will come out with a little bit of greenish blue tint. It's real easy to clean. So I share that with you. And of course, uh, as always, you can come back to this channel anytime for more information. Don't forget to comment below because we answer those. Oh, happy distilling.